and good morning everyone. Welcome to this to today's session on nurturing healthy brain development and attachments. Um, healthy brain developed through attachments and emotional well-being. Just like to introduce myself first, I'm Shamila um, and I'm a mother of four wonderful children aged between 18 and 8. I moved to Dubai in the UK in 2001, so that's about 19 years in Dubai so far. I've been working in the early years sector for around 20 years, and I'm currently a nursing manager in a Norwegian nursery here in Dubai. Firstly, I'd like to say we're all grateful to Abu Dhabi's Early Years Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. It's always lovely to come onto such platforms and share information um, and help answer any questions that might arise from that. Before we go any further, I'd like to mention that your active participation is important throughout the session. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid any background noises, um, which might distract us from listening to the webinar. Throughout the presentation, we'll be managing the chat functionality. You can enter your questions and comments in the question box at any time. I'll come to these questions at the end of the session, and I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. If you'd rather ask me a question in person, please feel free to raise your hand um, by pressing the raise hand icon and somebody will um, assist you and I'd be asking you to unmute your microphone and you'll be free to ask me any questions. Um, any questions not covered during the Q&A will be answered after the session and we put, will be put up onto the website. All participants, you'll all receive an email to the link and, and also um, a recording of this session will be available on the website too. So here we go. Before we begin, I'd like to just refer to our poll that we had out earlier um, before, uh, on registration. A question was asked, it was, um, when is the most rapid and important brain development? When does it occur in a person's life? And there were four options. Um, three to five years, 76% of you opted for that option. Five to 15 years old, 18% of you opted for that one. 15 to 25 years old, it was 5% and none of you selected the 25 plus option. So let's see, um, that's the poll. Let's see how we do as we go across to the webinar. I'm just gonna bring up my um, presentation. There you go, I hope you can see that. So nurturing healthy brain development through attachments and emotional well-being. Whoops. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, um, why does early childhood matter so much when it comes to the brain development of a child? Now, at birth, a baby's um, brain is about quarter the size of an average adult brain. Incredibly, it doubles that size in the first year. Um, and it keeps growing to about 80% of the size of an adult brain by the the time a child's three years old. But amazingly, while the child, by the time the child turns five years old, the brain has also almost developed about 90%. And it, that means it's almost fully grown. So that's why we say brain development is very, very connected to early childhood. What happens in early childhood will support what happens to the brain. Worldwide research has proven that early brain development has a lasting impact on child's ability to learn, to succeed, to do well in life, to be holistic, very strong human beings and adults. So I often come up with the example of um, therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists. So as we know, when people go, and we've seen it in movies and we've seen it elsewhere, when we go to a therapist, um, one of the most common questions the, um, the therapist or the psychiatrist, psychologist will ask us is what kind of childhood have you had? That shows that it has a huge impact on what we are as adults. What happens to us in the early years will basically shape us as adults. So if we want our children to have a happy, successful, um, comfortable um, and confident life, we need to make sure we instill all those qualities right from the very beginning. So the quality of a child's experiences in the first few years of life, positive or negative, will, help, will actually help shape how the brain develops. Um, an extreme example would be anybody who's been committed of any crime or um, has gone in a situation where they've had 
to have some kind of therapy. You know, this is a worst case scenario. Very much um, possible that their early childhood has not been as calm or secure as it would have been for someone who um, would probably stay away from those activities. Um, so that shows an extreme case as how the brain um, is developed through what happens to you as a child. So um, I want to talk about a little bit about how the brain works um, and for you to understand what happens inside our heads here when we're being um, exposed to different experiences. Now, a newborn, a newborn uh, baby has all the brain cells or neurons um, they will need uh, for the rest of their life. But it's the connections between these neurons and uh, brain cells that need to be made and secured to really make the brain work. So how do we make these connections? Um, information and research has shown that at least one million new neuron connections or synapses are made every second um, when a child is under the age of five years. And that's more than any time, any other time of life. So to make sure that those million neuron connections are happening or the synapses that are taking place, uh, we need to be sure that we're providing those children with a secure, um, a, a secure surrounding environment, a secure a relationship. Um, and, and the early childhood years are crucial for making these connections um, last and be strong. And it happens through repetition and continuity. So any weak connections are replaced by other pathways or will disappear. So this is called pruning. So an example would be when we say repeat, 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 you're playing with a child and you're repeating the same activity. Those connections and neural connections inside the brains will become stronger. If we're doing an activity where we um, say good morning to everybody every morning as you enter the nursery, those synapses will become stronger in the head and those neural connections will become stronger. So it will become a habit for children to come into a setting and say their good mornings. Um, so any unused connections or things that happen once in a while that haven't been repeated, they'll just get lost somewhere. And it's called that, that, um, uh, that pathway or that is called pruning. Um, those connections will be removed. So um, we need to make sure we repeat, repeat, repeat any kind of activities that we'd like them to take forward. Um, these images here show um, the neurons and connections and the pruning that I've mentioned earlier. If you see the first one, you can see that at birth, uh, neurons have already developed. At three months, you can see that they rapidly develop. And at 15 months, if you look at the picture, you can see that the, um, the connections are there, but if you look closely and you can see where there's a dark patches, those are where those connections have become stronger. There's been repetition of activities. There's been a repeated incident that's happened over and over again. That's actually then become a strong connection. And those are the ones that stay. And eventually what would happen was those dendrites will, the ones that are the weaker ones or the light colored ones, they'll start pruning away and you'll be left with very strong um, instilled connections in the brain that will then go on to shape um, children as they grow into adults. Uh, the next picture you can see an impoverished neuron is the one with less branches on it. There's been no repetition, no support. Um, so the, the pruning has happened, happened extensively. Whereas if you look at an enriched neuron, darker and more branched out and more secure. So we all want to do our best as parents and we need to do things right. We need to facilitate and nurture a healthy brain. How do we do that? I'm going to go through a few pointers now to support you on how you would support your baby, your child to have a healthy and nurtured brain. So relationships, attachments and emotional well-being. We as parents are the most important people in a child's life. We often underestimate um, what effect we have on our child's development. Um, we often um, disregard what our actions may instill upon a child's brain. So as mentioned earlier, all experiences and interactions we have as children will lead to connections being formed between the brain cells. So we being 
the first people, the first point of contact from when a child's born, the most important people in a child's life, we have the power of um, making sure or um, confirming that each child has a positive experience to form positive connections between the brain cells. We want these connections to be made, but we also want them to be strong. For babies and toddlers and young children, this happens through relationships, attachments, and emotional well-being, so stability. Every child needs stability in their life. Every child needs a secure relationship in their life. Um, as you can see in the image I've um, picked out to put on this slide, you can see that the, the, the mind has sparked neurons with this connection. And the feeling of a cuddle, a hug, um, you know, a time spent together, those are all those things that can support emotional well-being and support relationships and attachments that we have with our child, which will then um, instill confidence in the child to then carry on those qualities to support them in adult life. I'm going to go through a few things that I've mentioned here a little bit more in detail. Um, relationships that are developed when connections are formed, especially emotional connections. Personal relationships can be seen as having um, qualities of close connections between two or more people, or, yeah, two or more people or groups of people. Those connections are strengthened through emotions, through um, a sense of trust, through reliance. Relationships are continually evolving through emotional support social support, practice, motivation, reliance. We all need relationships in our life. And we know as adults that if we have positive relationships during our life, we feel more secure, we feel happy, we feel content. And it's the same with babies and children. They need to know that they have good relationships with the people around them. And those most close people are their siblings or their families, their parents. Um, and those are the relationships we need to work on. The term attachment is used to refer to emotional relationship between people and children. Um, those people who spend a lot of time together create attachments and bonds, and those bonds are important for security, for safety, um, for a sense of trust and comfort. So we have to make sure we work towards attachments in our relationships, and the two together will create emotional well-being. Um, and this is when a child feels that they've been valued, they're heard, they're important, um, their views count. Uh, and, and through a positive early childhood experiences, we're nurtured into socially and emotionally strong individuals um, who recognize our own abilities. Um, and the way we do that is when we've had secure relationships, uh, which create secure attachments. Um, and we can deal with situations that might arise um, in, in, in our lives. So when we, and then going back to the same notion, if we would like our child to have a happy, nurtured, healthy brain, we need to provide them with secure relationships, um, with strong attachments, which will lead to emotional well-being. Um, and they will be able to deal with different situations in their life as they grow. Um, children have a sense, strong sense of, sense of worth and become confident young people when those around them get to know them as individuals and support their well-being. In a nursery, um, coming away from the home setting just now for an example, when a child does a piece of art, we value that piece of art, we um, uh, celebrate it by putting it onto the wall, put their name next to it, maybe ask them a little, about, a little bit about what they drew or what they painted and how important it is to them and display that information as well. That gives a sense, a strong sense of confidence to that child that we're appreciating the efforts, we recognize their skills and their um, activities that they've done in the classroom. That's just an example of what we do in the classroom to support attachments and relationships because from the home, their next step is when they come to the nursery or come to early year centers where they need to then again form their relationships and attachments. Now an important factor to remember is if those um, relationships and attachments have been secured at home, it's very likely that children will be strong to continue that skill um, in early year settings and in school and then in adult life in their own relationships as well. So this is really important that you um, create this surrounding. Now, how can we do that? How do we create strong attachments and relationships with our children? There's several ways. And today I'm going to be looking at three very important words that come into mind when I talk about brain development and this training I've done with my staff and with 
parents as well. And these are the three common factors that come around care, communicate and play. So these are the three things that we can do as parents, as early age educators to support our children with strong attachments and relationships. So the first one I'm going to look at today is love, is care. We all need to be cared for, we know that. We are, I know that as an adult, you know that as an adult, to be cared for is very important. Now for a child to be cared for is, is crucial um, and is a crucial element to positive brain development. Um, and how can we do that? I've got a few examples here in front of us. Um, love them, be warm, loving, affectionate, lots of cuddles. Um, and you realize that children love to be close to you. I mean, if you're not cuddling them, they'll be holding onto your leg. Um, that's important to them. They feel a close connection with you and they feel a strong bond and they feel very secure when they have the opportunity to be close to you. So do take time out to just maybe sit close to them if they're very young. Um, touch them, cuddle them, rock them, hold them against, against you. Very often you realize when a child is born, the midwife will pick up the child and put skin to skin. That's very important because a bond as mothers and as fathers, we have with our children um, and a skin to skin contact is, and is an amazing feeling. Um, and having four children of my own, I know, and as your parents as well, you'd know just that time out to be able to have that opportunity with, with your growing children is really, really important. Um, stroke, stroke them gently when you're changing them, talk to them, connect to them when you're having a nappy change, or when you're bathing them. These are duties sometimes with our busy schedules. We, um, uh, we do often kind of rush those um, routines. And why not make those routines into rituals, you know? Do have conversations with children when you're changing their nappy. Connect with them, eye-to-eye -eye contact. Um, and the same, during, um, the same during bath time. You can definitely connect with them during those times that we normally see as chores, but you know, it's a brilliant time to connect. Bedtime, bedtime stories. Um, make your child feel physically safe. Um, wrapping them up. And as you see, um, a lot of the times when we're, and this I'm talking about newborn babies, we do wrap them up very tight when they're, when they're younger in their blankets. And a lot of the time it's because we want them to feel um, a sense of security, maybe, maybe um, uh, reflecting or uh, copying the same feeling as in the, in the womb, the secure feeling. As they grow, obviously you can't wrap them as much, but you know, be close to them, make them feel physically safe. Um, talk to them, and that's really, really important. Pick up on any cues. Get to know your child. Are they tired? Are they hungry? I mean, as mothers, we, as fathers and mothers, we know a certain cry a child has. Why is that child crying? Do they need a diaper change? Are they hungry? Do they just need a cuddle? You know, um, get to know your child. Um, spend time with them and understand their cues. Respond positively to any anxiety or any stress that children may have. At times we become very frustrated. It's a busy life, um, a child crying. Sometimes, I mean, as parents would frustrate us, it's very important to understand that we need to respond to their stress and anxiety in a positive, calm manner, because that makes them feel safe. And it also teaches them that when they're in a position where they're dealing with somebody who's probably having some kind of anxious or stressful time, they would then revert to copying what we've done with them and they would be a calm and responsive person supporting their friends maybe supporting their siblings as they grow so please um, you know please remember it's very important to respond positively to these situations taking time to observe your baby and told them learning about them as i mentioned pick up on cues it's the same thing get to know their interests understand them um, give them a choice. Uh, and, and again, I'll mirror what we do here at the nursery, we give children a choice. We value their opinion. We take time to observe them, um, get to know their likes and dislikes. And the same thing you guys would do at home. And when we do that, we're actually setting children up to understand that they're being cared for and they're being valued. The second, um, uh, the second very important point I'd like to mention is communication. Communication is key. It's the power of interaction. 
communication happening here, communication one-on-one, face-to-face. It's how we respond and learn to respond to situations. It's how we learn and pick up language skills. It's how we understand each other um, through communication. Talk to your child as often as you can in a soothing, reassuring tone. Um, You can talk about what you're doing, um, tell stories, um, and, and usually we discourage um, baby, uh, baby voices or baby language using proper language, whichever language you're communicating in, in, in proper adult kind of conversation. That helps children learn the power of communication as well. So the more you communicate with children and the more tones you use, you're asking a question, you raise your voice, uh, you raise your tone at the end. If you're um, speaking quietly because maybe somebody's sleeping or it's night time, they will learn those cues as well and they learn that power of communication through language skills. Sing song to children. Um, it's fun that we often sing to ourselves. Children love the sound of um, rhythm, of song, um, and, it, and it usually helps children become more calmer. Um, your child would not mind if you've forgotten the words, so don't worry if you don't know the whole words to the nursery rhyme that you want to sing to them. Just sing with them, and they will often join in. Um, they'll often be a part of your uh, singing routine, um, and it's a lovely way to communicate. Music is always a fantastic way to communicate as well. Dance, music, enjoy, um, and, and, yeah, and, and sing together. Um, your, your baby or toddler will look in your eyes while you talk and follow your um, facial expressions. So look in their eyes as you speak to them. Um, I mean, uh, having somebody in front of you and not looking at them or straight at them when you're communicating um, is is rather uncomfortable for both both, um, groups of people. When you're with your child, they look for reassurance in your eye contact, in your facial expressions, in your language tone. Um, let them know the connection between words and feelings. If you're happy, a big smile. If you're interested, show an interesting face. Um, and and they, will, they will link those two together and, and use those as they're growing, which will again secure um, communication skills. Give them plenty of attention, lots of attention. Um, and this can be as simple as getting down to their level and gently putting your arm around their shoulders as they play. Um, um, have family meals together. Family meals can strengthen relationships and a sense of belonging, that's for sure. I always make sure, um, and it's hard with four children having an 18 or an eight, um, to get them all to sit down at the table together because often you'll have um, light banter, light communication. You can discuss the day with them. And even if you have a toddler or a baby, keep them close, keep them close by so they kind of pick up on those cues as well. And as they grow, they'll understand that this time is special time during the day. This is probably the only time the whole family gets a chance to sit together and communicate while they're enjoying a meal together. So do make them part of this, um, of this, this part of the day. Um, and sometimes, yeah, I do understand babies have to sleep early and maybe the dinner, dinner is a, a later time. Use the opportunity for lunchtime or maybe tea time to have them around while you're having these family times together. Um, I did mention reading together and definitely reading together with your toddler creates a special time in, for bonding. Um, and it also stimulates your toddler's imagination and helps you learn about words. Um, so you can actually create scenarios when you're speaking with your child or reading a book with them, um, age appropriate books, and you can point out uh, or you can have a guessing game. Can you see the flower? Or oh, this is a flower. This is a, a doll. Use communication. And the more you communicate with your child, the more they bond coming back to the first situations that we spoke about as in attachments um, and bonding with your child, reading together. And often parents like to tuck their child in with a bedtime story. And that is your time to bond, as is your family meal times together, as is your singing time together. Um, and so on. So lots and lots of time together, communicate as much as you can to create those bonds. The third um, vital communication factor that I see here to support you with your relationship, your attachments leading to child well-being um, would be play. Play with your child. 
um, how can you play with your child? You don't have to buy expensive toys. You know, and often we used to see the whole notion of, oh, we don't have toys to play with. Children can play with absolutely anything and they will be engaged for hours. Um, and it's so much more enjoyable when there's someone to play with. Um, outdoors is a fantastic way to enjoy um, running, play, play football, uh, maybe have races, have a cycle, um, ride bikes together. And these are fun, wonderful ways to enjoy play. Play music, sing songs, gentle tapping on your child's hand or tummy while you're singing, connections. So your main um, objective behind all these activities, care, communicate and play, is to connect is to form those secure relationships and attachments. That's your ultimate goal. Because what will happen, as mentioned, is that will lead to healthy brain development. Babies love tummy time. Um, it helps your babies develop muscles and strength and control. But it also helps your baby see and experience the world um, in a different perspective. Why not be a part of that? Join them. Tummy time, tummy time. It's a wonderful way to connect. Gentle tickles together, explore materials with different textures like feathers, mud, metal, foam. These develop a sense of touch as well. So everything we're doing here has multiple outcomes. Despite us having the main, um, our main objective as attachments and relationships and securing them, these, these, play, these communication skills, play skills, these care activities will all lead to so many more learning outcomes um, and as mentioned having a sensory box maybe having different things from around the house feathers as mentioned um, you can have different items from the kitchen a few items from your cupboard put them into a basket explore these items with them use language to communicate with them is it strong is it rough is it soft is it warm these are ways you can connect with your child as well. Peekaboo is a very old fashioned, very traditional game that we all love playing and babies absolutely adore it. Peekaboo is a great, great opportunity for your child's social and emotional development and it creates a sense of trust and fun. So when you're hiding behind the blanket and it's peekaboo and you're back again, children understand the sense of trust. You've disappeared, but you're still there. You've hidden away, but you're still there. Great sense of trust and a really fun game. And often after these games, you can hear giggles. Um, it's a fantastic way to connect. I love baking with my children. Um, they're slightly older, but when they were younger, I definitely baked with them. And it's an activity that we like to do in, um, in our nursery settings with younger children as well. So baking, enjoying Play-Doh together, drawing together, painting together, have some music in the background while you paint and join in, join in with their play um, and prompt them and support them. And if you don't have time to join in with them yourself during the day, have siblings support them. I'll be, I'll be in close proximity, be, be close by. Um, play dress up with scarves, uh, cardboard boxes, um, different hats. Uh, wooden spoon can become maybe a wand, it can become a broomstick, it can become a, um, a, a wizard stick, it can be absolutely everything. Um, so allow them to explore and, and, and imagine, use imagination and be creative. And the way we do this is we supply them with different modes or different objects of play um, and, and then join in. And it's very important to join in. Cardboard boxes build dens together. Children love building dens. Um, and none of this is expensive things. You know, these things are easy to get hold of, easy to um, uh, enjoy together. So, yeah, that's another way we can um, connect. So as we come to the end of this session, I'd like to kind of sum up uh, what we've spoken about. We've spoken about brain development. We've spoken about the synapses and neurons in the brain and how to create strong ones. Uh, we've spoken about the importance of repetition um, and any situation that a child may, um, uh, may experience, um, positive or negative, the more they experience that, the stronger the brain uh, will adapt those um, neurons and then they will shape children in the future. So what do we want to do? We don't want children to have negative experiences of ne negative 
um, repetitions of information. We want them to have absolute opposite of that. We want them to have happy, strong, meaningful relationships. We want them to be happy in themselves. We want them to be confident in themselves. So what we do is we can, we need to form these secure attachments and support emotional well-being through love, care, and play. And if we combine these three together, we're surely going to have a very happy baby, just like the one in the picture. I love this picture. Um, Thank you. Um, I hope I've covered um, all that you'd expected from today's session. Um, I want to see if any of you have any questions, please. I'm going to just come out of, oops. I've come out of my presentation um, and we see if we have any, any questions. Please do ask, um, anything about the sessions that we've um the information that we've spoken about this morning it's one of my absolute favorite topics so i'd love to answer any questions on it um, i have a question that's just come through um okay mum has asked do experiences change the actual structure of the brain um yeah brain develop is actually activity dependent and in every experience a child or baby has um whether it's the first time they see a rainbow maybe the first time they ride a bike uh, the experiences uh, excite certain neurons circuit and leave others inactive. So the circuits that are turned on and are consi consistently um, uh, followed or are kind of visited or revisited, and over time, as I've mentioned, they become stronger. And while those are uh, while those are really excited, may drop away and be pruned, and that, that process is called pruning. So yeah, um, if a child a child's activity um, that they face or experience, it definitely does change the structure of the brain. So we want to provide them with positive experiences so the structure remains strong and healthy. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. Is it too late to work on developing kids' brain after the age of five? Um, no, it's actually not too late. And the best thing is to, to prune away any of... Um, to have the process of pruning so the synapses kind of diminish and, and um, positive synapses are created. I think the best thing to do is repeat the positive experiences that you want to have from your child. So if you find that there's certain aspects a child has been um, uh, exposed to or different areas or different experiences they've been exposed to that you're not so happy with in the first five years of life, don't give up hope change it around or turn it around immediately um, and then focus on those three elements that I mentioned, the care, the communicate, um, uh, care, communicate and play. And, and through those processes, you will be able to turn the child's brain around. It's not fixed. Yes, um, it, it becomes a little bit more harder because the child's brain does develop almost 90% before the age of five. But I think um, what we need to do is we need to create a situation where we can work as hard as possible and keep focusing on those positive, 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 and eventually the pruning will happen, which means those, those synapses will become weak because they haven't been revisited and uh, they may diminish or they may um, slightly remain there a little bit. They won't completely go away. So it's very important for those early, those first five years, but yes, you can. Um, through hard work, for sure. It does, it does take longer. Thank you, Hind, for that question. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, I have a question here. Um, does what my child eat affect the developing brain? I think that's a question that many of us have. Um, and we always talk about nutritious, nutritious food and we talk about unhealthy food and we talk about takeaways and we talk about homemade food and does that affect the child's brain? Now, in an extreme case, is a child who's been malnourished, uh, malnourished, malnourished um, or are not just for eaters, or actually haven't had the proper nutrition or proper um, adequate calories or protein in their diet. Um, yes, their brain will be affected um, and quite severely affected. So we're talking about um, a huge amount of malnutrition. We're not talk just talking about for eaters. I'll speak about for eaters in a minute. Um, but anyone who has not had that proper um, 
um, adequate calories or protein in their diet throughout this time, their brain would not grow properly. They will not grow mentally and physically properly. Um, the brain size might be very small. Um, language development will be delayed. So we're talking about extreme cases. Now, if we talk about fussy eaters, um, we want uh, what we can say is with fussy eaters or children who have packaged or takeaway food, um, yes, in comparative, a child who has nutritious food, a healthy balanced diet, good amount of sleep, you would find that um, children will have a healthier brain, will be more apt, more um, confident, and will react to situations in a more positive way if they've had a good nutritious lifestyle or healthy lifestyle. Whereas children on the opposite side who are maybe fussy eaters, who eat takeaways or eat packaged food, you will see some kind of delay there. Um, uh, and as we all know, if you, when we all start eating healthy and having our water in the morning and having healthy food, our minds seem to work faster. It's the same for children. So yeah, definitely um, supply your children with a healthy diet. Uh, breast milk is amazing. Um, but in, I know some parents, mummies cannot manage the, the milk, powdered milk also has been um, Spotified has had lots and lots of nutrition added to it. Um, uh, so yes, definitely have make sure your child has a healthy diet. Um, do we have any more questions coming up? Okay. I have... Thank you. Thank you, Hind. Um, so I have another question that's come up and, and, it, and the question is, my child prefers to play alone, so does not want me to play with them. Um, can I, how can I secure attachments through play where I'm not being involved? So there's two aspects to look at when we speak about play and a child who would rather play on their own. The first one I'm gonna to speak to is related to the presentation today. Um, be close by. Um, they might not want you to play with them because they're very, um, happy in the situation they're playing in they're quite happy playing on their own but they need you there and you just by having you around maybe in the kitchen or close by still creates that sense of attachment and belonging for sure um, so do, do be around and maybe the past the odd comment come and ask them and see if they're okay but do step back because they're not comfortable playing with you that's absolutely fine you can still form secure attachments by not being physically interactive with the child during their play. Now, if a child is playing on their own very often um, and does not play with any other child, and you've noticed that over the few years, observe it for some time. And this is away from the presentation today, but do definitely, we, we look into different ways of how we can get children involved with, in, in, in play with other children. So maybe play dates, take them to different play areas, uh, maybe start nursery because they need to know how to interact with other children and and we did say communication is one of the key factors so definitely do communicate and create situations where the child will learn to communicate with other children so definitely be around um, and respect the fact that a child wants to play on their own but you know be there to answer or any any questions um, and uh, basically your presence is just a crucial element of securing um, considering bonding and attachments um, I still have time to answer some more questions. Do we have any more? Any more questions? We have a question on language delay. Um, so a child, um, my child has language delay. What can I do to help him or her speak? Okay, so focus on communication, lots of talking, singing, encouraging, um, imitation of sounds and gestures, it's very important. Read to your child, um, and these are all things that I've spoken about in the presentation, um, and start reading as soon as possible. Even a, a newborn baby will benefit from hearing sounds and gestures, seeing gestures and hearing different tones of voices. Look for age-appropriate books, touchy-feely books, um, the ones have different textures, soft books um, uh, that you can take into the bath with you maybe, um, picture books, lots of pictures in them. Uh, encourage children to look while you name the pictures. So the more they hear your voice and your sounds and your, um, uh, your representations of 
the, the, the play or the singing or the books that they're reading, the more they will take in the information that they hear. Use everyday situations when you go shopping. I often mention I'd, um, I'd have my youngest in the trolley and I just keep talking to him about the shopping that we're doing and the colors that we're seeing and naming different items. And, and often people walk past me and say, he's a baby. I knew, um, and as you would now know moving forward, is that the more you communicate with children, um, and the more you communicate with children, the more language they will acquire. Um, when you're cooking, making a meal at, at the table for dinner time or meal time together, language, language is key, it's a key to interaction. Um, avoid baby language, do remember, because children do not learn from baby language, they learn baby language from language, baby language. We want them to learn proper language and um, whichever language you're speaking. I have a, another question from him then about um, sharing with a sibling and if they refuse to share. So if a child refuses to share with a sibling, being an older sibling or a younger sibling, I think becoming a part of their play um, will encourage them to understand how fun it is to play together. So if you're there with I don't know how many siblings there are, but if you're there with, say, for instance, there's two siblings, you've got the child that you're speaking about who may be two or three years old, and you've got a younger one or an older one. If you're there and you're actually imitating the sharing and how fun it is to share, they will actually acquire those skills over time. Anything that you do and anything you'd like to instill in a child's brain will take time. And over time, those dendrites and those neurons are um, strengthened and become thicker and stay so we want to teach them a new skill and that new skill is sharing so what do we do we start at the very beginning and we imitate what we'd like or show them or display role play what we'd like them to do and then show them the benefits of that uh, activity so for instance if i'm playing with my um i have twins so as i was growing up i had siblings together the twins who regularly didn't want to share so what I did with the older sibling is I would often play with him and, and try to make it fun. And they would often watch and then they'd join in. And as they would join in, they would learn the trick or learn the skill of sharing. So um, lots of, I mean, I even talk, talk to them about it, you know, and if they're at an age where they don't understand, speak to them um, and let them know how important it is to share. So it's possible just over time. Don't get frustrated. We need those dendrites to become strong and they take time. Um, do we have any more questions coming on? Uh, again, the same question came up is, if your child is older, um, is it too late to fix things? No, it's not too late. We need lots of positive experiences, lots of bonding, um, lots of interaction, lots of love, lots of care, um, and that will support a healthy brain. Uh, which, uh, will support children to have a healthy brain um, and that's what we need to nurture and we are and as uh, early years educators often say we are the most important and most enduring um, connections a child would have um, in their life uh, where the first connections that they're going to have as parents so as parents we want to do the right thing um, and these are the kind of training sessions we give to early years educators as well because many times as a child's born they, they go into nursery um, and have spent time, some hours in nursery as well as they grow up. And that's always um, from zero to five years. So the same kind of, um, the same training is given to early years educators. And we understand the importance of these three elements. Um, care, again, I'll repeat the same thing, the care, the love and the play. And through those three elements, we'll be able to secure attachments. Secure attachments we'll have uh, will um, remain throughout life um, in positive ways in positive ways um, and, and will support children as they grow up. So I have a question here from, oops, where's the question gone? I think I, okay, so I have a question. I have two questions here. So I have another question. I just, I don't know where it's gone now. It's about the frozen vegetables. Are frozen, frozen vegetables. Now, we always say fresh is best. Um, but if you get organic vegetables and they've been frozen, uh, you're actually locking in the nutrition. Whereas if they process vegetables and they're frozen, they're not gonna give any uh, nutrition value at all. Um, if you bring in your own vegetables and freeze them, 
Um, oh, yeah, so this was from Sarah. So your question here was, do you think frozen vegetables are healthy for my daughter? Um, so I actually think if you bring your own vegetables and you freeze them just for convenience sake, um, they're fine because you've brought those organic or fresh vegetables and you've frozen them. The pre-frozen vegetables, um, you'd have to read on the packet and see if there's anything been added to preserve them. But anything that's packaged has or has preservatives, I would say no, no to that. Um, definitely all fresh. And then it says here, sometimes I'm struggling my three-year-old to finish her food. She will eat at the beginning, but after a few spoons, she won't eat anymore. And I found that this is very challenging as a parent because I don't want to help her eat. I want her to be independent. Okay, so feeding. So if you have a child who's a fussy eater, doesn't want to eat, has a few spoons and runs away. Now, there's one notion my mom always taught me and I believe that's true and I'm being in early years for so long. It's something that I often said to parents is children usually don't go hungry. Now, what we need to do is we need to keep food um, at meal times, meal times. So is there anything around that's distracting her? Um, um, is she in the living room while she's eating and not in the dining table? I think if you create the right scenario for um, food time um, and, and eat with them, so again, the communication, interaction, and the attachment and bonding will be creating at the same time. So organize or arrange your meal times where you're eating something. If it's not the same meal, you're eating something with your child. So make it a collective activity. Make it something you're doing together. Um, and you'll find that your children don't have any distractions, no iPads, no phones, no toys, no TV. Meal times are meal times, and meal times are special times. And I think if we instill this notion in children that it's meal time now, everything away, let's sit down and enjoy our meal. Communication, lots of small banter, small talk is, is essential during meal time. Um, so something else. She has her own chair, she sits there alone. So, okay, so um, so what I, no, I've got my chair in no. Okay, perfect, no ITV, no iPad ready, that's brilliant. So she has her own chair. If, if she's sitting with you at the table, she wants to get down. However, she's not sitting with us, she wants to get down from the chair. So I think the important thing is um, many children like to run around and you know, get up and we need to make sure that we, um, instill a positive experience for children and so they understand that they need to sit at the dinner table and the same way is is lots of um role modeling um and and actually if they've gotten into a habit of getting up and running away and being allowed to do that in the beginning not saying that you've meant to allow it it sometimes it becomes frustrated and think okay you know what? i'll feed you later i think if they keep being brought back to the table then we need to finish our meal before we go anywhere um, and, and over time, uh, those, those that that will that value will be instilled and become it will become a stronger um, it will become a stronger routine. And I think over time, if we repeat the same thing, it'll be something that should be used to doing. Um, I think if it, and sometimes we kind of have different areas for children to sit on. Um, uh, if it's the same. If it's an area where you are sitting down and having the meal with them, I'm sure that they will be able to follow those eventually. It does take time. Nothing happens overnight, as I mentioned with some of the other activities. Um, okay, so a question, the same question. Um, Zara, thank you so much for this. Um, you said, so if she doesn't eat, you threaten to take her, or you say that you're going to take her favorite toy away. Um, you shared that kind of um, gives, and I don't think that's a good idea. So I'm gonna go back to the brain development again. Um, so nurturing a healthy brain. When we use, and I'm gonna use a very harsh word as threaten, or we say, we're gonna take this away if you don't do this. Children then understand that, and you know what? They're just gonna take it away. Yeah. And then as they grow up, uh, they'll be used to people taking things away from them so they can do something that is favorable to the other person or then they will adapt those kind of ideas as well so as you realize if there's a sibling or a friend um, they would say oh, if you don't do this for me I'm going to do this so we don't want any consequential conversation um, what you can say is oh what are your toys are waiting for you you know you you know as soon as you've had we're going to do this so it's more of a an incentive than a punishment so I think that's really important the two words we don't want to punish a child for not eating yet we can give them an incentive to look forward to when they eat 
Um, and I think that's something that's really, um, really important for, um, for, for this kind of scenario. So lots of repetition, lots of positive um, chat, um, lots of positive scenarios um, will create positive outcomes. And just over time, it will take time. Um, like I said, nothing will happen overnight. So be persistent. Um, meal times are meal times. Uh, and yes, you, you know, wow, it's amazing because after that, we're going to do this instead of I'm going to take this away. So maybe that will work. Let me know how it goes. I think there's a part I missed here. Oh, I've got some more. I hope, thank you so much, Zara. I hope that has helped. Um, this, a lot of what I'm speaking about is from personal experience as well, having the, the four. Um, I've kind of had these different scenarios and I've seen how they work and because I know the effects certain situations have on nurturing that healthy brain, I think we need to change our our approaches slightly and become quite and become persistent in our ways to create those strong attachments and strong repetition um, scenarios where the brain develops in that positive way or positive direction that we want it to point to. Um, is there anyone anyone else who has any questions? Thank you so much, Sarah. That's that's wonderful that you uh, you took something from there. Let's see if there's any more. As some more questions are coming through, I'd like to just mention a couple of things before we finish off. Um, if I have a poll coming up next, um, Hara, I think the poll we can bring up and then I can finish off. So there's a question I'd like. Yep, so the poll's up. Um, so I'm just waiting. It'll be up for you guys to see in a couple of seconds. Okay, so yep, yeah, yeah. So how knowledgeable do you feel about importance of brain development in children now? So that was quick. So we, we're just waiting for some all of you to kind of give the feedback, which will be really, really, really nice for me to see. Uh, for us to see and see what you've what benefits you've had from the session today um, it's been really um, exciting for me to share my knowledge and I hope it's been uh, been informative for you all as well so in 42 percent about halfway thank you uh, Vijaya thank you so much um, I'm glad you found it informative I enjoyed presenting it um, uh, so can I, oh, 50% of you are Come on, I need 50% more of you. We need you all to give a quick vote. Are oh, we doing okay so far? Oh, I still have some that I don't show. So how are we doing? I'll give you another 30 seconds, guys. We'll, um, and then I can, I can close the end of the poll and we can look at the results. Lovely. Thank you. Five seconds, guys. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to end the poll. Um, so I can see that 75% of you um, have a clear understanding, which is fantastic. So I, I definitely. Um, and then I have the rest of you understand the basics. I have a couple of you saying you're still unsure. If you have any questions, um, if you, any of you have any more questions on anything that you're unsure about, I'm, we've still got five minutes. So please pop those questions on and I'll see what I can do to support you. Um, in the meanwhile, I'd like to mention a couple of sessions that are coming up. So the first thing I'd like to mention is um, I have another session. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'd like to um, have you all back again for my third session. And that will be on discovering the world around us, exploration and imagination. And that will be on the 26th of September at the same time, 11 o'clock. Join me. 
Um, I've got lots of lovely um, facts and information that I'd like to share with you all. And I'd love to hear your feedback. It'd be very interactive today. Um, and the second session I'd like to remind you all about is um, a session that will take place there at 6 p.m. by Dr. Samir Kazi, who is the um, Advisory Executive um, Childhood Education International in the US. She is a board member of the Arabian Child. This session will be in Arabic. Um, and it will be on the reopening of nurseries um, in the UAE and all what parents need to know. We encourage you all to participate as she'll be answering all your questions. Um, and the next session will be in English and that will be exactly the same information, exactly the same time, 6 p.m. Um, and that would be on the 26th of um, September. So the same day that I'll be doing my sec third session. I did my first session um, in August. My third session the same day in the evening, um, Dr. Isami Kazi will do the session in English. So that would be on the reopening of nurseries, um, all what parents need to know. So we look forward to having you all back for that. Do share that information as well if anybody else may seem interested to know what's going to happen in the new new. We're all excited to open up our nurseries. Um, I, um, I think we're all done. We're all ready to to finish off thank you so much guys i've had a wonderful morning it's been really exciting because i said this is a topic that's very close to my heart um and we hope to um have you all back soon and register for the next session so thank you see you all and have a lovely day <laughs>